welcome back to another episode of Storytime with Mr. Bates. I hope everyone is staying healthy and safe, especially now that people are starting to get out and about a bit more. Uh, Today's episode focuses on the Mongol Horde, specifically a descendant to none other than the fearsome Genghis Khan. Let's get to it. Many people often associate the Huns and the Mongols with each other, but it's important to note that they are two distinctly separate cultures. Um, Many believe the Huns are descendants of the Xiongnu, which uh, were China's ancient enemy. Those of you that know about the the Great Wall, you understand that it was built for the Xiongnu, not necessarily the Huns. Now, there are, are some historians that say that the Huns descended from that group of people, but there are others who dispute that claim saying that there's not a lot of strong historical evidence for that so just keep that in mind however the mongols are an entirely different group uh they began as a collection of separate regional tribes in northern asia genghis khan united all of them under his rule and thus created the mongol empire now this empire that he created would eventually grow to be the largest contiguous empire in all of human history it was so large in fact that at their height the Mongol Empire was about five times larger than the Roman Empire was at its largest. In terms of modern day countries, the Mongol Empire controlled almost all of what would become Russia and parts, if not all, of what would become Korea, Persia, India, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, Iran, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Armenia, Georgia, the country, not the US state, Belarus, and the Ukraine. They were able to conquer so much because of a few key advantages. First, they were incredibly skilled at fighting on horseback, uh, especially with their bows. Now, the image of the Mongol horde bearing down on their enemies with their swords raised and kind of going to town, it does have its historical basis, like that is accurate to a degree, but the favored weapon of the Mongol horde was the bow and arrow. In reality, Mongol warriors were incredibly skilled at taking care of their enemies from a distance while still staying on the move, making them very difficult to attack. Now imagine this, you're attacking the Mongols, you know where they are, you're going to get them. Um, They come riding into battle and they surround you before you're, you're even aware that they're there. Or they're riding alongside, picking off your colleagues while you're trying to get into position to attack. That's what made them such effective warriors. They could move very quickly and attack you from a distance at the same time. They don't have to stop and plant and then attack. They can attack while they're moving. Second, Mongols intermarried and interbred with conquered tribes and cultures after destroying their government and killing their leaders, making the next generation all part of one tribe. So because they're intermarrying and because they're they're taking members of these new conquered tribes and sort of marrying them into the Mongol tribe, everyone is becoming one tribe. They're killing the leaders, so there's no one saying like, hey, I don't want to do this. Well, too bad, (laughs) you're done. This would ensure loyalty. In fact, some say that 8% of the population of Asia today can trace their bloodlines back to Genghis Khan himself because of this practice. Third and final, uh, thirdly and finally, the Mongols were very feared. They had a very fearsome reputation during this time. The story of ruthless conquerors who maim and pillage anywhere they travel, though a bit hyperbolic, scared people to their core. In fact, there are accounts of entire towns surrendering at the first sight of Mongol riders, with some even welcoming them as heroes. They didn't want to fight. They knew from the reputation of these Mongols that, oh, if we try to fight, we're going to get destroyed. So, There were some cases where these towns just said, you know what, hey, come on in, welcome. By the time of Genghis Khan's death in 1227 CE, the Mongol Empire had grown to dwarf any other empire in history, and his place in history had been secured. His descendants continued to hold high status in the Mongol Empire, which leads us to his great-great-granddaughter, Kutulun.
Being a princess of the Mongol Empire, Kutuyun or Kutuyun, I'm not entirely certain on the pronunciation, but I'm going to go with Kutuyun, had no shortage of offers for marriage. Uh, these proposals led to one interesting tale. Now, Kutuyun was no Disney princess. She was a warrior in her own right. Uh, she was a capable rider and a proficient archer. However, uh, the skill that she was apparently most known for uh, was kidnapping individuals from opposing armies to bring them back for interrogation. However, her greatest skill, historically speaking, was in wrestling. Now let me be clear, we're not talking about the John Cena, Macho Man, Randy Savage type of professional wrestling. The wrestling we're talking about is Mongolian wrestling, which is a unique kind of wrestling that's closer to what you'd be doing on a school team than what you'd see on WWE or AEW programming. <clears throat> Anyway, she was so skilled at this that she could pin trained, experienced Mongol warriors with only minor difficulty. Eventually, it came time for her to get married. Kutuyun agreed that she would marry anyone who could out-wrestle her. But to make it interesting, she said that anyone who tried and lost would have to give her 100 horses. Many men came to ask for her hand in marriage and many lost. Eventually, she came to own 10,000 horses thanks to these matches. Over time, however, rumors started to spread about why she didn't want a husband, why she kept uh, beating all these men and didn't let anyone beat her. <laughs> these were vicious and untrue rumors, but they continued to spread despite her best efforts. So she eventually chose a husband to marry. No, he did not beat her in a match. But, she became her, or, but he became her husband nonetheless. His identity, however, is something of a mystery. Some sources claim that he came from a very important uh, tribe in the Mongol Empire. Others say that he was an assassin who attempted to kill her father and was captured and she fell in love with him while, while he was a prisoner. And uh, finally, we have Rashid al-Din Tabib, a respected statesman and historian from Persia, who claimed that her husband was Gerzan, Gezan, I, I'm not entirely certain on how to say his name either, the Mongol ruler of Persia at the time. I want to be clear here that owning 10,000 horses, which we know she came to own, is no small feat. Think like a Mongol here for a second. You're a warrior of a nomadic tribe, conquering towns and villages to add to your empire. What are you riding in battle? If you're like most Mongol warriors at the time, you're riding a horse. You're riding on horseback. Horses were a very, very valuable commodity in Mongol culture, not just to warriors, but if you're in a nomadic tribe, you have to keep moving. Horses make that a lot easier than just carrying everything on your back and walking on foot. They were, in a very real sense, the lifeblood of Mongol culture. Anyone who owned 10,000 of them would have been considered very, very wealthy. Kutuyun died at the age of 46, 28 years earlier than the current life expectancy of women in Mongolia. Her story was rewritten to be a little more glorious, uh, then used by her cousin Kublai Khan as propaganda during his time as ruler of the Mongol Empire. However, her story didn't reach Western Europe until the Italian merchant and explorer Marco Polo came and interacted with the Mongol Empire and his travels across Asia. He recorded her story himself, and it was published along with the other memoirs of his travels back in Italy. In fact, some of the pictures in this video depicting Kutayun were made by European artists thanks to Marco Polo's stories. That's why you may have seen some uh, pictures of her in like European dresses or <laughs> wrestling European women. It's because European artists painted those and they didn't quite understand how to depict her. Um, while the story of Kutayun may not be widely known today, she has resurfaced in American pop culture, uh, most recently in the Netflix series Marco Polo, though that show is not very historically accurate or reliable. So if you watch it, you know, keep that in mind. It is over-dramatized and uh, the dates aren't entirely accurate. And that is that. I hope you enjoyed learning about the wrestling warrior princess of the Mongol Empire. 
Unlike previous episodes, this was a topic I didn't know too much about before I started researching for it. I had an idea, like I, I knew that she had existed and I had briefly read about her, but in researching this video, I, I learned a lot more than, than I, I started with initially. So I learned quite a bit as I was making this episode and I hope you learned quite a bit as well. Personally, I am rather glad we don't have wrestling matches as part of our proposals today. <laughs> I feel like that could end uh, pretty poorly for many couples. Now, let's take a look at the question of the day. Why do you think Kutuyun made her potential husbands wrestle her instead of simply saying yes or no based on love or practicality? As always, leave your answer in the comments below, and I'll see you in the next episode. Please remember to like the video if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more weird, interesting, or strange history videos every Wednesday. If we can get to 100 subscribers, I plan to start doing videos on ancient myths as well, so please share this video with anyone else you think might enjoy it. As always, have a great rest of your day, you lovely, lovely people. Bye.